G'day everyone, my name's Barney and today we're going to be making Conway's Game of Life inside a shader and we're going to be using P5.js to do that. Now, P5.js is a creative coding library written in JavaScript that makes doing this sort of thing really simple and we can just get shaders up and running. I'm going to be breezing over some of the details for how to get shaders set up inside P5.js, but if you want to learn more, you can check out this video here where I go into detail on how to set that all up. And of course, in the description, there will be a link to this exact code so you can read it along with me while I I'm explaining it. Now, if you don't know what Conway's Game of Life is, I've actually also made a video about Conway's Game of Life way back in 2018. So brace yourself for young Barney. But basically what it is, is it's a cellular autonomous in Conway's Game of Life. There is a grid full of cells and each of those cells has a state. And then based on the neighbors around a cell, the state of that cell will change for the next generation. So whatever the neighbors are determines what the cell will be in the next state. And this is quite a laborious task for the CPU because we have to go through each individual cell in the grid and figure out all of its neighbors and then figure out what it should be in the next generation. Whereas on the GPU, when we're using a shader, we can run each individual cell at the same time and it's lightning fast. So in that previous video I did on Conway's Game of Life, each individual grid cell was rendered quite large on the screen and this was to reduce the size of the grid overall, meaning that the CPU could actually handle the number of cells that I had. Whereas now what we're going to be doing is we're going to be doing this as each individual pixel will be its own cell. So with all that out of the way, let's jump into the actual code. So the first thing I've got here is I've got a GOL shader defined. So that's game of life shader. And then in the preload function, I load in that shader and I load in a file called GOL vert and GOL frag. And these are obviously the vertex shader and the fragment shader respectively. And I store them in that GOL shader object. Now in the online P5.js editor, if you come up to this little arrow above the line numbers and you click that, it'll show you all the files in this project. So as you can see here, I've got a GOL.frag and a GOL.vert and we'll go into those in a minute, but I just thought I'd show you where they are so that you're following along with me. So once we've loaded in our shader in the preload function, we can then go to the setup function. And in here I'm creating a canvas, which is 600 by 600 pixels. And I'm using the WebGL rendering mode. And if you recall from my previous video on shaders, we have to use the WebGL mode in order to get access to shaders. So this is a very important step to remember because we're doing the game of life on a per pixel basis. I've also set the pixel density to one and I've turned off smoothing so that we don't get any anti-aliasing. So we get crisp black and white definition between the alive and the dead cells. So in order to do that as well, I've got the background color set to zero, which is black. And then I'm also setting the line color or the stroke to be 255, which is white. So we're going to be representing the alive cells as white and the dead cells as black. I then also set the shader for our sketch to be our game of life shader, then setting a variable called normal res inside of our game of life shader to be a vector containing one divided by the width for the X value and one divided by height for the Y value. And what this is, is how big a pixel is on the X and the Y axis when it's normalized between zero and one. And we need this to be able to calculate the neighbors of any given pixel inside of our shader. Then coming down to our draw function, we are just going to be drawing a line if the mouse is pressed between the previous mouse position and the mouse position. And again, if you recall from the last shader video I did, when we go into WebGL mode, the center of the screen is actually the zero zero coordinate. It's not the top left as we're used to. So I'm just offsetting our mouse X and mouse Y positions by half of the width and half of the height of the screen so that the mouse position actually lines up with where we want to be drawing it on the screen. Then what I'm doing is I'm actually using this get function to essentially get a screenshot of the current screen on the canvas. And we're passing that into our game of life shader as a variable called texture. So inside the shader, we now have the information of what the last output from our shader was. And we can use this as the beginning state for our game of life. And then we're going to use that inside of our shader to figure out what the next output should be. And so then we get this loop of feedback from the output of the shader actually looping back into the input of the shader. And this is how we're going to create our game of life. And then to actually trigger our shader to run, I'm just drawing a rectangle across the whole screen. And again, I've got to offset this by half the width and height because we're in that WebGL mode. And so now we've got this all set up to actually run our game of life shader, which is where the actual heavy lifting is done in terms of figuring out which pixels need to be drawn onto the screen. So just like the previous shader video, this vertex shader is very simple. In fact, it's the exact same one as the previous one. It's essentially just the bare bones that we need in order to get the fragment shader up and running. So we'll go to the fragment shader next because that's a lot more interesting than this one. So at the top of our fragment shader, we've got a few variables coming into the shader. So firstly, there's the VEC2, which is the VTEX coord. And this is just the coordinate of the pixel that we're currently rendering onto the screen. 
Then we've also got these two uniforms, which are the ones that we set from inside our sketch, if you recall. So we've got the text, which is the texture of the screen that we passed in in the draw function. And then we've also got the normal res, which is the size of a pixel essentially that we set in the setup function. And these two variables will be the exact same for each pixel in our shader. And that's why they've got the uniform prefix. Whereas the vtex coord will be different for each instance of the shader program that's running. And that's why it's got the varying prefix. So the first thing we do inside the main function for our fragment shader is actually to switch the orientation of the Y coordinate. And this is because in P5JS, the Y coordinate starts in the top and in the shader, it starts at the bottom. So we're going to have to flip that Y direction. So in order for the game of life to work, we need to figure out in the previous generation, what was this location? Was it dead or was it alive? And to do that, what we can do is we can check the color of this location on that previous generation, which is stored in the texture that we passed in. So I'm using the texture2d function to check at our location what was the color of the previous texture. So inside the color we get back, we actually have four values for the R, G, B, and A, but we only need one of them to know whether this pixel was dead or alive. So in this next line, I just check the color's R value and store that in a float called A. And then if A is one, we know that the pixel was alive. And if it's zero, we know that it was dead. And of course, the other really important thing for the game of life is figuring out what the neighbors of this current pixel are. And in order to do that, I've got a float here called num, which starts at zero, because we're gonna count the number of neighbors. I then have two for loops that go through all of the neighbor cells around our current cell. And I have to calculate where in the texture these coordinates are. And so you can see here, I'm using that normal res to know how far is one pixel to go either side of our current location. And then I use the texture 2D function again to get the color of this location of the neighbor from the previous generation of the game of life. And then I'm adding the, whether it's alive or not into this number. So again, I'm using the R value. And if the R value is one, that cell is alive. And if it's zero, it will be dead. So this number here will now store how many neighbors this current cell has. However, the way that these for loops have been run means that we've actually counted the current cell as well, but we only want the eight around the outside, not the current one. So at the end here, we just have to subtract our value from the number value. And this will give us the final number of neighbors of the current cell. Then what I'm doing is I'm actually implementing the rules of the game of life. So we've got our current cells state of being dead or alive and how many neighbors we've got that are currently alive. And based on this, we can figure out what we should output for the next generation at this current location. And because all of our values are floats, I'm gonna be using 0.5 as a cutoff point. And this is just to account for any inaccuracies in the float value. I'm not sure that this is necessary at all. If it's not, let me know in the comments, but I'm just playing it safe by using 0.5. So what I've got here is in this if statement is if the cells value is greater than 0.5, which in this case means if it's alive, then what we're going to be doing is checking how many neighbors we've got. So if the number of neighbors we've got is less than two, then what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be setting the next generation to be dead at this location, or if the number of neighbors we've got is greater than or equal to essentially four, we're going to also set the cell to dead. And then otherwise, if the cell that we're currently at is already dead, but the number of neighbors we've got is greater than three or less than four, the cell becomes alive. So at the end of all these if statements, we've got stored in the A value, whether or not the cell should be alive. And this is represented by a one if it's alive and a zero if it's dead. So we can just create the output color based on this value. So we can pass for the R, G and B values, whether or not it's dead or alive. I know all of this shader stuff can be a bit intimidating when you're first starting out, but the results really speak for themselves because on the screen here, Running in real time, we've got Conway's Game of Life where each cell is a single pixel on the screen. So we've got millions of pixels running right now and it is blazingly fast compared to my old version of Conway's Game of Life, which was done on the CPU. So I really hope this has given you a bit of an insight on the possibilities of what you can achieve with shaders. Because with this method, we can pass in the results of the shader back into the shader and get a loop that's kind of like a compute shader running inside P5JS. Thank you so much for watching this video. I really hope you have learned something from it. Maybe you've learned something about shaders or about Conway's game of life. If you have any questions or suggestions, please let me know in the comment section. And if you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. It helps out the channel immensely and consider subscribing for more videos about creative coding and shaders and game dev and everything to do with that. There's a video here that YouTube reckons you'd like next. And otherwise there's a playlist here with all my other P5JS videos in it. So you can become a wizard of code in no time at all. I'll see you next time.